Your family theater presents Jack Benny, Dan O'Herlihy, and Rod O'Connor. Cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated brings you The Hound of Heaven, starring Dan O'Herlihy with narration by Rod O'Connor. To introduce the drama, your host, Jack Benny. Thank you, Jean. We have an inspiring story on Family Theater this week. The story of a poet who shall live forever in human hearts because he was able to put into words, powerful, vital, beautiful words, the eternal story of man's flight from God. Dan O'Herlihy will play the role of Francis Thompson, while Rod O'Connor will act as narrator in this drama of a poet and his poem. I fled him. I fled him down the nights. Yes, you fled him. You eluded him. I fled him down the nights and down the days. Yes, you twisted, turned, tried to escape him. But did you ever really escape him? Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy face? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I descend into hell, thou art present. His name was Francis Thompson, and of all the lonely and obscure men who lived in London that year of 1887, none had made his bed in hell more surely than he. For him, each night was a lying down in hunger and fear, each morning a slow awakening to pain. Here yeah, you there, get up. Get up, I say. Yes, yes. You can't sleep here, you know that. I, I know, I know, I... I'm sorry, officer. Get along with you now. Come on, get along with you, I say. <laughs> For Francis Thompson, waking upon the Thames embankment, each morning was a slow return to pain. A remembrance of dreams twisted by hunger, made hideous by fear. Dreams of delirium shot through with dying stars in the river's mist that always had their ending somewhere at the broken edge of the world, with the nightstick prodding his chest, the agony of waking to another day. And then as he would get to his feet, brushing the dirt and matted leaves from his coat, pulling it tight about him against the fog, London, too, it seemed, returned to life with the first cab in the street clop clopping by, the first mackerel peddler crying his wares, with the first farmer's cart piled high with Surrey hay, and the whistle of the Edinburgh Express coming down from the northern hills. As he awoke, London awoke with him, and they faced each other at the beginning of the day, the man of bone and flesh against the city of stone, the man with a tired heart driving his broken knuckles against the stone which never yielded. Each day began as another, a halfpenny for a mug of tea, tuppence for a stale loaf of bread, a furtive search for an old rag, a wadded newspaper to line his shoes, and then the long tramp in search for work. Pardon, sir, will there be a place for me somewhere? Sorry, no work today. Would you be needing a man to maybe... Sorry, to... sorry, we have all the help we need, sir. Unemployment, Francis, unemployment. It's the scourge that can lash a man's spirit as a cross, a contradiction of economies that hangs heavily upon the shoulders of people like you, Francis. So you've got to keep walking, keep searching. Maybe somewhere you'll find work. You can't stop now to rest. <laughs> Take a turn down this street. Now there, through the crooked alley to the haberdasher shop. Sorry, no work for you. Try the greengrocer across the street. Sorry, Sorry no, no work, work for you. you. Perhaps the wine shop, try that. Sorry, Sorry no, no work, work for, you. for you. The warehouse, the warehouse. Sorry, Sorry no, no work, work for you. Sorry, no work for you. Yes, Francis, the day is over. The long tramping from door to door. Huddle there in the darkened doorway and take your rest. There will be no bread for your hunger tonight, no roof above your head. There will be no drug to soothe the madness in your throat and brain. 
Lie in the doorway and take your rest, for tomorrow's another day, and if you live, there'll be more miles to walk. Death comes slowly to the afflicted, so you cannot hope for much tonight. What's that? A drum, perhaps. It could be the failing beat of your heart. No, no, it's not that. I, I hear it often. It, it stops, then it begins again. Your imagination. No, no, it, it sounds like footsteps, as though someone were following me. Don't be silly. Try to rest. No matter where I go, I hear them. They follow me always. It's the drug, Francis, you're craving for. Try to get through this night, and perhaps tomorrow you'll find work and money, and then you can buy it. It's not the drug, or my imagination. They are footsteps, and they follow me wherever I go. I'm like a man with the hounds crying after him, a hunter thing in a swamp. And I hear these footsteps. Night and day, I hear them. There. There. You hear them? I hear a drum. I hear my heart beat. Wait. It's footsteps, all right. Someone's approaching the doorway. Hello. You there. Are you all right? I'm all right. Why, laddie, you shouldn't be lying here in the doorway. You'll catch your death of cold. Here, let me help you up. I, I, I'm all right, I say. Oh, are you? I tell you, laddie, this is a bad night for a man's body and soul. What right have you to talk about bodies and souls? The right of one human being to another, laddie. Well, you can save your words. I'm not interested. Ah, maybe so, laddie. But there's a kind of lonely pride in your face that tells me you're, you're a man fit for better things than lying in doorways. Look... Look, my friend, you mean well, and for that I thank you, but I'm sick, I'm tired, and I'm hungry. Oh, lad, I know you're sick. I know you're alone. That's why I'd like to help you. What, what do you mean, help? I want you to come home with me. My name's McMasters. Uh, I'm a cobbler by trade, and I can put you to work if you want a job. Work? You'll owe me nothing, lad, nothing at all. But why should you do this for me? Why shouldn't I, lad? If the situation were reversed, it's you who'd be reaching out your hand to me. This way, it's my good fortune. Here, come along now, lad. It's a warm bed for you tonight and a good day's work in the morning. Hello, Francis. How goes the work? Not so well, Mr. McMasters. Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't think I was cut out for a cobbler. You're just learning, lad. It's only three weeks you've been here. Tell me, lad, uh, now, I don't want to pray or anything, but what, uh, what's your trade or profession? I have none. If, if I did, I suppose you'd call it journalism. You write, then? Yes, Mr. McMasters. What do you write, Francis? Well, the usual thing, I suppose, reviews, essays, some poetry, the, <laughs> the sort of things that never sell. Hmm, uh, here, lad, try some of this tobacco. It's an Irish mixture. Thanks. Uh-huh. Light? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, where did you go to school, Francis? You sure? It's about four miles from Durham. You were studying... I wanted to enter the priesthood. I failed. Uh, I'm sorry. It's strange when you come to think of it. I'm 28, you know. You'd think that in 28 years a man would be able to win... to win one victory. You'd think that. But it isn't true. After I was rejected for the priesthood, my father sent me to Manchester to, to study medicine. Six years, examinations every two years. I failed all of them. Defeat for me was like a web. I seemed to be caught in it, woven into its pattern. After a while, I became afraid to try anything at all for fear I'd, I'd fail at it. That's why I came to London. To break the pattern? No, to lose myself. To crawl into the darkest corner of the city and... And hide. Oh, laddie, laddie. And how long have you? Two years come November. Two years? On the streets, in doorways, the way I found you? Oh, no, you? no, no, not always. I was a bootblack for a time. I worked for a bookseller. I held horses, sold matches. I never kept any job long. I spent most of my time in the library, reading, writing. <laughs> Things that wouldn't sell. Only I had to write them. Laddie, how could you do it? How could you live? You're not a fighter. You weren't made to walk the streets and fight the city the way you've had to. No, it's a poet and a lover you are, Francis. And I wonder, how could you live? How? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it was because I prayed. I'd say that, only sometimes there was even no belief in my prayers. And I felt as if I were not being heard. You see, living the way I did, in, in hunger, a disordered, nervous condition, 
loneliness. You, you can't think clearly sometimes. You doubt your own mind's power to think. And then, then you can't pray right. Only I went on praying and... I'm still alive, that's all I know. And God willing, you'll stay alive, Francis. For you've a roof over your head now, and a job, and maybe time to write. Maybe time to write something great and good. It would be pleasant to be able to say that Francis Thompson settled down to an ordered life and turned out a great work of literature. That he rewarded his benefactor in some generous way. But the facts are quite different. Thompson was useless around the cobbler's shop. He was willing but clumsy and inefficient. He scribbled verses when he should have been working, and his few earnings were spent to satisfy the craving for opium which constantly tortured him. He spent three months with McMaster's, and then one day he disappeared. McMaster's waited for him to return that night. He waited many nights as the autumn months passed into winter, but Francis Thompson never came back. Of the many unfortunates, McMaster's had befriended and given jobs. Thompson alone proved a disappointment. He was my only failure, McMaster's wrote. He was my only failure. Here, you. Where do you think you're going? Uh, what? what? Uh, stay away from that church. There's other places for tramps. I, I, I wasn't going here. You're drunk. Dirty. Going to crawl into the church where it's warm, eh? Thought no one would see you. Go on. Get on your way. The church? Yes. Get along, I say. Yes, that's where I can go. Here, you. You come <laughs> along with me. I'll take you to a place where... Here. Here. You come back. Come back. Come on. Christ, have mercy upon me. The Lord have mercy upon you, Francis Thompson. Have mercy. Upon your weakness and failures. Have mercy. And through you on all the poor and broken who walk in the city streets. Help us all, O oh God. From the city itself, from the cruelty of stone and the horror of the pavement. Defend me, O oh God. From the almshouse and prison, from the makeshift bed in the doorway. Defend me, O oh God. From hunger in the day and wakefulness at night, from the torn coat and the broken shoes from the stairs of pity and the stairs of contempt. Deliver me, O oh God. From the man whose hand is against us, from his anger and his clenched fist, from the sudden blow against the mouth. Deliver me, O oh God. And give us this day our daily bread. Give me this day my daily bread. But more than the bread alone, O oh God, give us the strength to earn our bread. Hear me, O oh God. Christ, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on me. Time to go, Francis. The church is empty. The sexton is putting out the candles one by one. I, I, I cannot go. If I leave, I'll forget how to pray. You must. Where? Somewhere. The doorway, perhaps. There's that grain warehouse in Cock Lane, if you could force a window. No, 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 no. The, the, the rats. There's always the embankment. It's snowing. Then what? I don't know. Perhaps this is the end of all my running. Death. Death comes slowly to the afflicted. But not to me. A loaf of bread, a, a mug of coffee in three, or, or is it four days? The dizzy spells, fever, the cough. No, no, it, it can't be far off now, even to me. Do you want to die? Do I want to live this way? Do you not know, Francis, that while you live, your body is the temple of God? God doesn't live in me. God is perfection and health and beauty. Can God live in a broken body and a mind that doubts its own reason? No, I lost God sometime after I left the cobbler shop. I lost him somewhere in the alleys of East Cheap. But has God lost you, Francis? What? Has he lost you? But if I deny him, how can he find me? Listen. Do you hear that? The footsteps. The footsteps of the hound. Do you remember, Francis? Footsteps. Yes. Yes, they always follow me. But there's something inside me. Oh, God. God, forgive me some fear, some dread that keeps me running from those footsteps. Hello. 
Hello. Huh? Huh? What's wrong? Why are you running? It, it, it's nothing. I... Oh, he's fainted. Please, someone help me. Help me, please. How long have I been? Three days. Don't you remember? You were running along the street. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember now. And you were the girl that... I you... brought you here to this boarding house. But, but why... I tried to find out who you were, what your name was. But there was nothing in your pockets to identify you. Except this book. It had Francis Thompson written inside. Yes? I didn't know where you lived. If I am. It doesn't him. matter. I, I, I have no home. I, I've been sleeping outside on the embankment. A anywhere I not, go. I'm afraid I've you. put you to a lot of trouble. I, 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 think, I think I'd better go. But I... you can't. You're sick. The doctor said you must rest and eat. He said you were dying from starvation. You called a doctor? I had to. But, but that cost money. I, I, I've nothing to Don't pay. Don't say or... it. What's your name? Anne. Who are you? I mean, what sort of work do you do? Oh, nothing very much. Nothing important. Oh, I, I didn't mean to pry, I just wondered. <coughs> Anne. Yes? May, maybe you haven't done anything important, as you say. I don't know who you are, what you are. But I've been wandering across a, a plain of fever and delirium. Three days, you tell me? Dreams came up like clouds over those three days. But in the end, it seemed that I heard footsteps behind me. They were after me, and I ran and ran. And far on the edge of a plain, I saw a cross standing. And I thought, if I can reach that cross, I'll be safe. So I ran toward it. Only when I got there, it wasn't a cross. It was you. Do you understand? You mean... That you don't care what I am? No, no. I only wonder what I can ever do for you in return. And so, once again, through the kindness of another stranger, this time an outcast much like himself, the healing of Francis Thompson began. To him, this girl gave her the little she had, food, clothing, encouragement. But more than that, an ease from loneliness. To her, he gave things unknown in her life, tenderness and reverence and respect. And then at last, Francis Thompson began to write. The Passion of Mary, a poem. Paganism, old and new, an essay. Two things finished, actually finished. It's hard to believe that I had the power, the sheer mental power to work them through. Francis Thompson was right. His work was good. And Wilfred Maynell, editor of the magazine Mary England, published the pieces, sought out the author, and extended to him the hand which would lift him from obscurity. But Francis Thompson, about to reach for the hand, suddenly withdrew himself. What about Anne? Anne! Yes, Francis. Anne, I sold them to Mr. Maynell. And, and Anne, he's interested in me. He wants me to come and live with him, to do my work at his home. I, I, I mean, he wants us. Us? Yes. You see, I, I told him we were to be married, and that I would come... Only if you were with me. No. I want you to marry me, Anne. Don't you understand? Yes, I understand. But you... You're a great writer. And you've got the chance now to get away from this. Away from the streets and... be with people of your own kind. No, Francis. I will marry you. But why? You're not talking sense, Anne. Why? 
I'm not worthy of you, Francis. You know that. You're great and good. I might only hurt you. I might keep you from... It's, it's been good what we've had together, Francis. But you'll have to go on alone now. You'll have to go on alone. And so the girl who had lifted him from the streets vanished from his life. All that day he searched for her, all the next and the next, but she disappeared. He turned away from the extended hand of Maynell in his search for her. And days passed into weeks, weeks into a month, then two months as he tramped the mighty labyrinths of London, but he never found her. Among the millions of faces he looked into, none was hers. And then at last, one day, sitting on a bench in Covent Garden, barren from the grief that had drained him, he heard the familiar sound of footsteps. Francis? Yes. She's gone. You'll never find her again. I know. And now there's nothing left. Nothing but the footsteps. Do you hear them? I hear them. Think back, Francis. Isn't it strange how each time you've cried... Each time the horror of life has risen up to crush you, you heard the footsteps. Yes. Each time I've lost the sense of God, I've heard them. Only in those times? I would begin to hear them faintly, when my faith grew weaker, and my prayers. And then at last, when I had lost the sense of God, they beat like thunder in my ears. As they are beating now? Yes. And as they beat, the night Anne came to you? Yes. And the night McMasters found yes, you? Yes, yes. What are you driving at? Don't you know... Think, Francis, think. Is it possible you could touch God by the hand and not know it? The hound of heaven, the footsteps of God in Charing Cross. No matter where I fled, they followed. Down the nights and days, the twisted lanes and passageways of all London. Down the years and months and days, they followed. God's love pressing in on me when I denied him. God's love hounding me through the swamps of despair. God who wouldn't let me go, even though I had denied him. God looking at me out of her eyes and touching me with her hands. Yes, I know now, I know. These footsteps. Then search out your soul, Francis, and put what you find into words. All the hunger and pain and loneliness of these tortured years, write it, Francis. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. Write it for all to read, Francis, for the poor, the beaten, the hungry, the tempted, the weak... For those like you all over the world. I hid from him, from those strong feet that followed, followed after, but with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat and a voice beat more instant than the feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me. Put into words the streets and the sleepless nights, the cold sweats and the agony of thought. Put Anne into them, for you will never find her again and McMasters, and put the losing of God into words, the awful loneliness. For though I knew his love who followed, yet I was sore adread, lest having him I might have naught beside. And Francis put into words the joy that came when God had found you once again. And past those noised feet, a voice comes yet more fleet. Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Yes, put all this into words, Francis, that others may draw courage from them and find their way to peace. For it is you, Francis Thompson, who went down to make a bed in hell, but found God's love and mercy following you, even there. Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest.
And so Francis Thompson, who today ranks among the great poets, went on to build a new life for himself, aided by the kindness of the Maynell family, went on to complete the Hound of Heaven and give the world one of the most inspiring poems of all literature, the story of God's love and mercy. Thank you, Dan O'Hurley and Rod O'Connor, for your fine performances. We of Family Theater have been proud to present this story of a man and his conscience and his God. Now, that may sound strange coming from me. Like the hundreds of guests who have appeared on Family Theater, I spend most of my time trying to make people laugh, trying to make them take their minds off themselves. But that isn't enough to make them happy. Sooner or later, people have to stop laughing and start thinking. They have to put their minds on themselves. They have to reflect. Yes, reflect on how each of us is lost unless we have faith and hope in a God to whom we can bring our troubles and pray for help. That's the reason for family theater. Just a weekly reminder that all of us, and especially our families, need God and should pray to him. If you've been neglecting prayer, why not start today with your family about you in the circle of your home? Find out for yourself that the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Family Theater has brought you Diane O'Herlihy and Rod O'Connor in The Hound of Heaven with Jack Benny as your host. Our play was written by Frederick Lipp with music by Harry Zimmerman and was directed for Family Theater by Jaime Del Valle. Other members of our cast were Jay Novello, Eric Snowden, Ben Wright, Tudor Owen, and Jeanette Nolan. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who have felt the need for this type of program and by the mutual network which has responded to this need. This is Gene Baker inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Branch Rickey will introduce Eddie Bracken and Kathy O'Donnell in The Scout. Join us, won't you? This program came from Hollywood. Hear the dramatic story of the Allen family on Against the Storm over most of these stations every weekday. Yes, for big-time daytime drama, it's Against the Storm every weekday. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.